We are live, sir. Uh, very good morning, dear friends. I am Dr. Shamsul Huda on behalf of Arthur TV and Behar Press Association. We are going to organize our fifth webinar of uh, Prasuma TV Factions. Now I request our president, Dr. Manoj Chaudhary, sir, to say a word. Dear audience, delegates, and faculties, we are ready with our fifth webinar today. Today is Sunday. The lockdown has been extended. for further two weeks so we feel relaxed in this calm situation you can enjoy our webinar which is focused on very common topic the topic is proximal tibial fractures i am sure you will love it faculties and panelists participating are well known national faculties including dr john mukhopadhyay i admire him since beginning that is when he was doing his internship in pmcs initially for his dedication sincerity and punctuality and now for his knowledge and command over the subject welcome john thank you manish so the now the question our secretary dr rajiv rang sir moderator of this session will be evergreen stylist young enthusiastic bubbling dr amulya singh thank you sir forgive me if i have missed any superlative degrees for him <laughs> without taking much time i hand over to dr rajiv anand secretary boa he is also chairman of the cme committee of indian orthopedic association thank dr. you sir thank you sir and good afternoon everyone uh, on behalf of bihar orthopedic association i welcome you all for our fifth webinar on proximal tibial fractures and i welcome all our national faculty dr jitendra maheshwari is from delhi dr john mukhopadhyay is from patna dr dita mittal he is also from delhi and dr rajiv chatterjee is from kolkata i welcome you all sir and i welcome all the viewers who join our webinar all the delegates all the pg students and uh, i welcome our moderator none of the other dr amulya kumar singh who will moderate the session so without wasting much of the time i'll hand over to dr amulya kumar singh please uh, good morning everybody welcome to this big seminar on proximal tibia fractures friends we all know that tibia is one thing where we all are worried what to do and what not to do just i'm taking two minutes of you all because there are so much good people to talk to you proximal tibia fractures demographics 1% of all the fractures 8% of all fractures in the elderly lateral plateau involved in 55 to 70% medial plateau involved in 10 to 20% both are involved in 10 to 30% and here all the problems are now coming as we consider now it's going to be a when you see seeing the ct scan we are worried how we can manage whether through one incision two incision or three incisions this cause accounts for 5 to 11% of all tibial fractures it is usually a result of high energy trauma so now we want to manage it properly and we have got an excellent faculty in front of you so it is not only for the bihar orthopedic association members the pg students but people from all over india and maybe the global level are also watching on ortho tv so i will be sharing stop my slide shares i will be going towards this because let my mentor my guardian dr john take over and over to dr john first he is the speaker he will be talking about introduce the subject and gradually moving to all others but in between whoever is asking a question please direct it to dr samshol or dr rajiv or dr ashok syam so that we can take up the question dr john sir okay uh, thank you amulya and uh, also dr manoj dr rajiv and uh, samshol uh, uh, i think uh, in this uh, sort of uh, epidemic of webinars 
Uh, we've tried to make things a little different in this uh, uh, meeting today in that we're actually looking at things from the other side is to uh, look at why things go wrong. Then we are going to talk about how to avoid problems and then about radiology and approaches. So it's kind of slightly uh, uh, different from the normal uh, meeting, which starts with anatomy, mechanism of injury, radiology, clinical, etc. cetera. Uh, but the importance of it is to try and make you aware of what the problems are. And most importantly, at the end of it, hopefully you will know how to avoid these problems. Uh, and I think we've got an excellent faculty with uh, Dr. Jitain Maheshwari, who's going to start the ball rolling and talk about why things go wrong. So over to you, Jitain. You can share your screen now. Yeah, yeah. yeah Thanks, it. John, for this uh, nice webinar. Something actually very close to my heart, this topic. And right in the beginning, I must say, sorry, I start on the wrong side. So right in the beginning, I must say that uh, one that I'm starting to speak, which may, may means I may encroach upon a lot of the other things that other people are going to speak. Excuse me for that. I'm conscious of this fact and try to avoid that. And second, uh, because of my you know, 20, 30 years of experience in this and having seen all kinds of problems that happens after treatment of these fracture over the last three decades, I've become a little bit biased. So you can say, you might find a lot of eminence-based medicine, which is not the trend today, but I think it's my duty as a senior, as a experienced person to tell juniors, not only what is written in the book, they all read, they all attend webinars, seminars, everything. But I want to give them what I have learned over the years managing these fractures, which is very practical from our viewpoint. Excuse me if it is sounding like eminence-based medicine, but that's it is. So this is my own case done about 15 years back, which means I had already 10 years or 15 years of experience in orthopedics. And I did this very bad bicondylar fracture. It took me about two and a half hours. Looked quite all right. Medial plate, those days, those plates are available. And you know, after I struggled for almost uh, two hours, I came out quite satisfied when I saw this X-ray. And this is what happened within two weeks. The whole thing just collapsed like, you know, cards. And I realized that, okay, now there's a lot more to learn. The beginning learning starts right here. So from there on in my practice, I see a lot of kids. In, in fact, most of my practice is referral practice where I see these patients not as a fresh case, but mostly when something has gone wrong, unfortunately. And from there, I have learned what is going wrong, why it is going wrong, and what is happening. And there is a pattern in this going wrong. So I see a similar kind of a fracture again and again and again, which means there is some lack of understanding in the society about this fracture. And since this talk is like almost 20 years old, so you might find some of it is irrelevant today, but I've tried to make it up to date as much as possible. So first is that there's an insufficient understanding of the fracture complex. And the culprit for that is Schatzker classification. It used to be medial and lateral condyle, medial and lateral condyle, type 6. But actually, it is not only medial and lateral condyle. It is also anterior and posterior condyle. Now we have understood there is a, there is a sagittal component of this fracture, which is the main culprit. It's no more medial lateral. It is posterior medial, posterior lateral, purely posterior and things like that. So this is one big culprit, which actually made us fool because we always thought fix a plate on the medial side, fix on the lateral side job is done. Now, another problem is it is very difficult to identify this uh, coronal component. For example, this case was treated conservatively as a soft tissue injury, more or less. But if you see, this has a posterior subluxation of the tibia. It's hardly very difficult to make out because there's an anterior condyle fracture here. Patient, of course, came to me after six months when he could not straighten his leg, he had stiffness. And why? A soft tissue injury, why should the patient have stiffness? but there was something else happening. There was anterior condyle fracture. Similarly, this fracture looks like a nice bicondylar fracture. You can put a plate medially, uh, put one laterally and job is done. But as soon as you do a CT, you realize there is a coronal component to this fracture and you have to put the plate where it is required. So I think now we have understood and now with more and more CT being done, we are now understanding there is more to this than just shared script classification. Of course, new classifications have come also. Now, 
it is important to identify while fixing that there is a coronal component. And I'm using this term again and again, coronal component, which we identify now. Of course, everybody identifies a posterior coronal component these days, which is visible on the X-ray. If you don't recognize it and put a plate like this, it will go fail. But even if you recognize it and you put it for show medial plate, obviously we all know now that it works that way. But also there's another coronal component, which I have seen quite a few cases, which is anterior coronal component. This fracture, the coronal component is only anterior tibial condyle, very funny. And I just saw, I see almost one, six months, which is treated conservatively. And now of course with the MRI, I think it is being detected more often than not. But I almost published a series and I'll show you that. And this was a case which came fresh to me after about four days of injury. And I could recognize there's anterior tibial condyle depression fracture here. The whole thing is depressed, only anterior condyle. This is anterior tibial condyle, intermedial. And then we have to lift it fresh and put a small buttress plate with a graft to reconstruct that. So not only the posterior component of, uh, you know, the, the sagittal component, even anterior sagittal component. And this is what we published in 2014 in IJO, anterior tibial condyle fracture, which somehow I see, saw then one after another. And I thought it is being missed. So can I make a broad statement? Nearly no proximal tibial fracture is purely a coronal tibial fracture. I think just for young uh, doctors, you have to be almost obsessive in your mind to look for this sagittal component of the fracture. No more Schatzker, it is different. And we know there's a new CT classification which talks about that also. Uh, why I'm not progressing? Okay, so now next issue I want to discuss is so-called undisplaced fractures. I see a lot of these which are treated as undisplaced fracture in plaster and then they have problems. So there are three types of undisplaced fracture, let me say. One which will remain so, and you have to be sharp enough to recognize that this is undisplaced fracture, will remain like this, and nothing's to be done, you can give plaster or whatever. Then there are undisplaced fracture which are actually displaced, but we think they are undisplaced because we are not looking at them properly. Now again with CT scan, that has gone down. Third is the undisplaced fracture which looks undisplaced, but I should be smart enough to realize that this is going to displace. So not all undisplaced fracture has to be treated conservatively in a plaster and forget about it. Just to give you an example, undisplaced fracture treated in plaster six weeks later, same plaster, same fracture. And though I've had to go in, malunion, correct it, interarticular me, blah, 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 and fix it. Similarly, this patient was treated, even the MRI was done. And the consultant thought this is undisplaced, it can do very well with only conservative. And this patient came to me six months later, unstable, not able to walk, young guy. Nobody could actually figure out why he's not able to walk till we did a hypnea ankle x-ray and found that he's in varus. And I did a stress x-ray, varus valgus. I could realize the way medial side is opening. That means this fracture has collapsed on the medial side and it is causing instability. Actually, this patient was referred to me for ACL reconstruction. But actually, this was a instability because of bony malunion. Because somebody on day one thought this is undisplaced, can be treated conservatively. Particularly type 4 shed skirt fracture are nasty to be diagnosed like this and they displace like this. Particularly when the fibula is intact. So we, did, we had to again go in, do a osteotomy and fix it that way. Now this lady I treated about 25 years back and she saw me just uh, three months back. A similar, you know, lateral condyle fracture, those days CT was not done. She was treated in a plaster like this, told her that it's a minimally displaced, you can live with it, till she came to me after about six months and she was not able to walk. It was very unstable. And today we can see this lateral side condyle is gone. Of course, there was no CT that day, that time. And I just supplemented with this CT from another patient. This is what is happening in this patient. Actually, it doesn't pick up on X-ray, but when you look at the CT, it is, there's a big gadda there in which the lateral condyle is dipping every time she's walking. So that time we were not doing reconstruction of the condyle, which I would do today. I simply shifted the line of weight bearing by IT Bellos taught me, gave her more varus so that now she could walk on the medial side and she became stable, very good for 25 years. Now she's complaining of pain. Maybe she's now around 50 years of age. Maybe she will need some surgery sooner or later. So we have missed to identify these things in the past. So what I would say to youngsters who are attending this is, is spend time understanding the personality of the fracture. And that's not an uncommon statement everybody says, how to do it, my 
following uh, faculty is going to talk about it. I will not go into that. My approach briefly has become like this. Which condyle? One or both? And or no, I know there is a CT classification, there is an AO classification. Those are there, okay, for talking purposes, for publication. But when it comes to hardcore treating a fracture, what do I do? I look at the tibia like this, medial, lateral, anterior, posterior. Which of these condyles segments is gone? And that's what I have to address. Second thing I see is which plane is it? Is it purely coronal or purely sagittal or a combination? So that I know where it is going to go. And third, very important is looking at the X-ray and particularly a CT scan, I have to understand where is this fracture going to displace? Because that's what will tell me how to fix it there. So these are the three things I see in a upper tibial fracture when I see. For example, look at this. This fracture, my PG saw the way said there is a lateral condyle of tibia fracture. Looks very typical lateral condyle fracture till we did a MRI, a CT scan, and we realized lateral condyle is intact more or less. It is basically medial condyle and the whole thing is displaced. So it is not going to be a lateral condyle fixation. It is going to be rather a medial condyle fixation, buttress on the medial side and just a screw to support the lateral condyle. So primarily, it was a medial sided injury and not a lateral sided injury. Similarly, a coronal component, primarily, you cannot treat this from medial side. You have to treat it from posterior medial side, buttress it, and within three, four days, you can see the patient can move the knee as good as possible. So if you understand which fracture, where is it going, and where it will displace, now there are a lot of issues which I will not go into the details, which my subsequent faculty is going to talk about, whether you use one plate or two plates. I have my own rules. Then similarly, where to put the plate, of course, they, they will talk about this, where to put the plate, which approach, I'm sure they're going to talk about all this. But only thing I want to emphasize is when you're fixing, achieving alignment is the key. And I'm emphasizing the word alignment because we know we've got to do a intra-articular reduction, blah, blah, blah. But in this fracture, achieving alignment is most important. And I'll come to that why I'm emphasizing this. This fracture, for example, treated by very, one of very experienced surgeon, a close friend of mine with two plates. He understood that two plates are required, but as you would say, it looks fairly decent. I'm sure very, very well done job. Patient wasn't happy. The way he was walking with his two feet, he was almost unstable. So he came to me and you know, want, wanted something done and we had to do an osteotomy. Now why that happens is that I think the image intensifier fools us. It gives us only a limited picture. We can do very good intra-articular reconstruction, but sometimes we miss out on overall alignment of the limb. And these are young people, they have a normal limb as a reference. And if you do not give them exactly the way the normal limb looks, quite a few of them will be unhappy. But image is a culprit because it doesn't give you the whole alignment. So what I do is, I do all this lower limb trauma surgery, including distal femur and proximal tibia without a tunique. You don't need a tunique because I drape the whole leg and sometimes I even drape the other leg if it's a very cosmetic con conscious and both the legs at the end of the surgery should look same. That's what the patient is going to see. And your image can fool you, whatever can fool you, but your vision, seeing both are looking quite good, will not fool you. So alignment is guided in my practice more so by even draping the limb like that and seeing it. Now there is a, there used to be a fashion in the past of percutaneous fixation and some of these x-rays belong to that era when they'll pass one screw trying to hold it. And as you can see, these patients come back with these kind of problems, percutaneous screw again going somewhere. So that of course, I think today nobody's doing it. There's no percutaneous screw business. Now LCP, I want to emphasize, LCP is not a panacea. In proximal tibial fracture, more important is buttering function, buttressing. It is buttress function, which is more important than even angular stability. You can use any plate as long as you understand how to buttress it. So may not need all the expensive plates, even normal LCP, DCP, which you can mold properly, as long as you understand what function are you going to use it. So if you put a buttress LCP like this in the wrong way and you know, Medial condyle fracture, you're trying to hold it with lateral LCP. No, it will not happen. It will fail. So to come to the last section of my talk. So for all intra-articular fracture, we emphasize accurate reduction. And in this fracture, tibial fracture, alignment is more important than even intra-articular reduction. You can be a little casual on intra-articular reduction because that might lead to osteoarthritis 25, 30 years later. And believe me, 
in my career of 40 years, I've done knee replacement only on one patient who had a previous intercondylar tibia fracture. So possibly it is quite forgiving. A stable fixation is a must because it should not move, otherwise you'll end up with failure of fixation and all the problem. But early mobilization is something which I become a little particular about, not doing early mobilization, this fracture, and it doesn't harm. Let me explain to you why. So if you're not sure, delay mobilization. If you're not sure about bone quality, about bag of bones, you may have fixed well, X-ray may look good. There is no harm in delaying mobilization. And I'm sure some of a prolific surgeons like John will fix every fracture very well, mobilize next morning. But quite a lot of us, quite a lot of beginners, when they go into the OT, they know they're not okay. Everything is not fine. It is looking okay. And if I mobilize, it can go around. And that's why this cycle. For beginners, there is an extra wheel there in the cycle. When you're learning, be careful. You can go slow. By going slow in this intra-articular fracture, you're not going to cause stiffness. That's what I want to say. So problem of this fracture is malunion, loss of displace uh, reduction, and not stiffness. Stiffness happens in distal femoral fracture. In proximal tibial, it does not believe me. It will sail through in six months, nine months. Patient will finally have a good range of motion. It may not, but if it displaces, because you've mobilized it early, you'll end up with malunion, which means another surgery. So last but not the least, is operation always necessary? There are situations where even the best of surgeons cannot do anything. Bag of bones. You can put whatever plates. You can only create your enemy because some of those plates will only fall apart. Severe osteoporosis in our country particularly, poor skin condition, affordability of the patient, two plates, two approaches, your own skill set. If those things are not there, sometimes you can be conservative. And belonging to the generation 40 years back, I've treated quite a few of these fractures conservatively, just with a distal pineal tin tra pin traction. You can use a fixator, you can use whatever. But believe me, you achieve a reasonable reduction, good alignment, keep the patient six weeks in a bola brown splint in a traction, more often down, you'll be satisfied. So rather than, and this is a great saying that with it, about internal fixation, when she's good, she's very, very good. But when she's bad, she's horrid. And you put a plate, plate is walking here and there. Patient is going all over the country, all over the town, talking about you. Sorry, that's not the thing you should do. You must understand these four things and then go. So just to conclude, proximal tibial fracture is one of the most tricky intraarticular fracture. All of them are tricky, but this is more tricky because it is a major joint. The knee joint is a major weight-bearing joint. Any problem, it is a problem because patient can't walk properly. Often these are comminuted more than even even femur, and poor skin condition, poor bone quality, and we do ACL, we realize when you drill tibia what it means, and when you drill femur what it means. These are two bones very near, next to each other, but they behave differently, bone quality is different. And fracture is often in multiple planes, so you have to operate from front, from back, so quite a lot of drama there. Proper assessment and surgical planning is the key to success, and I'm sure my subsequent speakers will talk about it and uh, expand on this. I thank you everybody for your attention and I'll be very happy to take questions. I've created some amount of uh, controversy, I understand. That's okay. So with this, I think I'll conclude my and I stop share. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer right now or maybe later. Thank you very much, sir, Dr. Jitain, sir. It is said that human beings come to this world through pelvis, but what we feel, we all orthopedic surgeons, especially in the last 30, 35 years, had come to this field of orthopedic through your book only. When oh. we started in our undergraduate days, we studied your books. And mm -hmm. I passed it, this information to my father, who was there in Professor in PMCH. He thought that this is one of the best possible for the UG students. Thank you very much, sir, for enlightening you us. You made me feel so old. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. Sir, uh, the questions will be coming from uh, Rajiv Anand and uh, Shamshul will be asking. Just two questions from this side as a moderator. So what is the absolute indication for going for a CT? Because all pay doctors who are practicing in rural areas, periphery, where CT is not easily available. So what can be the absolute indication while going through the X-ray for CT? So let me tell you, I can give an answer because I'm biased. I will almost always do CT. I understand it's not possible all the time. But if you're operating, if you're putting your knife on that patient, please do not go into the OT without the CT. You can play with conservatives, some malunion in some villagers will be acceptable. But if you're taking the patient to the OT, I think make that extra effort, that extra money to do a CT scan. Otherwise, you may be in for a six and all your reputation for many years will go for a six. 
so don't touch a patient without a ct very good message for especially all the young generation or especially all the doctors who are operating and uh, second question maybe dr rajiv will ask if there is any one from my side sir uh, regarding delayed mobilization how much delay if you have fixed it very well then yes so it is it is written in the literature and i have practiced this and i have seen this if you immobilize a intercondylar tibia fracture even after operating for up to 6 weeks it does not make any difference to eventual knee movement the reason is very simple it is not the case with femur distal femur i want to mobilize next morning because quadriceps the regions happen here there is no adhesion there is only skin there so if you don't mobilize mobilize immediately it really doesn't do harm this is particularly for people who may be in the different stage of their career learning skills implant availability you know we use indian implant we use one plane instead of two we want to do everything through one incision so there are wide variety of surgeons who operate but if at the end of the case please do not go by this fixed criteria of synth ao teaching that you know do this do this do this that's okay for different kind of environment we work in a very different environment so in particular there is a leeway in this fracture if you because you know 30 40 years of my practice a lot of which is stiff knee releases i have till today never done a stiff knee release for a upper tibial fracture it is always distal femur fracture so that makes me feel believe that probably these fractures are foregiving as far as stiffness is concerned but they are all all the fractures of upper tibia i have treated as a second surgeon is mal union non union limping instability never almost never because of stiffness almost never thank you dr rajiv is there any question so, dr samshun just uh, one thing uh, 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 yeah. i think i agree to some extent that early mobilization is not always necessary but that should not be your aim of treatment your aim should be to try and get a good fixation to that you are able to mobilize them early not weight bearing in proximal tibia there's still some controversy as to when you weight bear them right. but in terms of mobilization your aim in your surgery should be get to get adequate fixation so that you can mobilize if you're not able to do that then perfect certainly perfect. Yeah. like people people like john will never uh, immobilize i understand because on the table you're no, sure no they may be fixation at different stages of their learning career no, I mean, but that should not be your aim ki i can do it no 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 not the aim i agree with you yeah. okay dr rajiv or dr samshan yeah uh, till now there is no question i think we will ask in the end okay yes, sir go ahead sir uh, dr john sir now okay. as far as the controversies and some complexities they are in as far as the finding and the management of cases are concerned what we were doing so it is now the right person in the right place principles of management by dr john mukhopadhyay right sir right okay so yeah so thanks uh, that was a great talk by jiten and uh, this is a follow up there will be some uh, overlap but i think it's good because it will emphasize certain points which are really important i think we are going to go through basically i think one of the most important things which uh, i think uh, jitend del deliberately did not mention was the appreciation of the soft tissue injury i'm going to talk a little bit about that learning and timing of surgery again uh, re related to the soft tissue injury understanding the fracture geometry i'm going to just touch briefly on that because ritab is going to talk about that in his uh, talk on radiology etc uh, and reduction and fixation again i'll talk about certain principles but rajiv is going to cover that in his talk so i think the most important lesson uh, apart from all the things that we've been mentioned earlier is don't ignore the soft tissue injury because if you do you'll end up with disasters such as this okay so just uh, i think it's important that if you have a patient with this kind of x ray and uh, a soft tissue like that with blisters etc you don't rush into surgery okay you need to splint it you need to elevate it you need to monitor the soft tissue you can use cryo ice packs whatever you need to try and get the swelling down and what kind of splintage do you use okay this can be a pop slab or skeletal traction through the uh, uh, calcaneum or distal tibia but probably if you have a situation like the one i talked about or showed where there's gross displacement there's soft tissue swelling with blisters the spanning fixator is what would be the most 
uh, appropriate way to splint them initially. And there are various reasons for it, which we can discuss. So the idea is to try and get provisional reduction, try to get a reasonably stable construct. There's not going to be absolute stability in any sense. And you have to try and avoid the zone of injury. So keep your pins away from the area where the injury is. And then once everything settles down, the blisters settle down, then you can go ahead and do your definitive fixation and the risks of wound complications become significantly less. Uh, here's an example. This was a, a X-ray of a patient who we had to deal with recently. Uh, this was the X-ray uh, taken in the clinic where he uh, was treated. Okay, And initially before that, uh, if you look at this, you may think, okay, this is not so bad, there's swelling. But just look at the earlier x-ray that this patient had. Okay, so very often when uh, you just pull the leg out, a fracture which is grossly displaced or a knee that is dislocated or subluxed can come back into place. And then your x-rays will not show the whole extent of the injury. So you really need to look at this patient very carefully in terms of what the injury is, the amount of bruising, the soft tissue status, uh, peripheral circulation, vascularity, all those things need to be looked at before you jump in with your knife. Okay, this was what was done. This was some kind of um, uh, minimal internal fixation with a plate which was uh, put outside, a locking plate used outside the body, which uh, people talk about as the ECPO. This is what he presented to us almost a month later. Okay, he had had multiple debridements, dressing, etc. And um, if you look at the limb, you may think it's salvageable, but he had no sensation, no movements. And then if you look closely at the muscle, the deep muscles are all dead. It's dead necrotic muscle inside. And so this poor chap ended up with an amputation. And by then it was an above knee amputation. So I think this is something one has to keep in mind. Uh, ignore the soft tissue at your peril. Okay. Uh, the other thing is uh, not uh, is compartment syndrome, and uh, a lot of the problems are related to compartment syndrome. Uh, not all patients with swelling have compartment syndrome, so you have to look at the peripheral uh, circulation, the movements, the uh, sensation, etc., carefully. And a lot of them, patients with blisters, etc., will settle down. But if they have a frank compartment syndrome, you need to do something about it. The other thing is usually if there's a compartment syndrome, the fracture will give you some indication that this is a severe injury, but occasionally you'll get uh, fractures like this. You can see there's hardly a fracture line going there, undisplaced fracture, but this was a limb that was crushed under a weight and his main uh, complaint was severe pain. Uh, he could not straighten his knee and if you touch the posterior part of his leg, it was rock hard. Okay, so he had a compartment syndrome involving just this deep posterior compartment. You can see the kind of clot there was, how the muscles bulged out when they were decompressed. And the moment we had done that, his pain settled down and we didn't really have to do anything for the fracture. We treated the fracture conservatively. Again, if you have a compartment syndrome, don't do uh, sort of uh, inadequate decompression. This is what was done for this patient. A segment of the fibula was excised. This may work as a prophylaxis for compartment, but in an established compartment is not going to help. And we, this patient luckily came to us early after this, and we had to do a really extensive debridement and a release of all the compartments, put on an external fixator. Uh, gradually things settled down and we could put on a, a split skin graft to deal with the soft tissue cover, the skin cover. And then this is him at 11 months post-op, he's gone on to heal. So we treated him only in an external fixator. We did not do an internal fixation for them. Now, the other thing is about CT scans. And uh, uh, the moment a uh, patient comes with a fracture, the general tendency is to get a CT scan. Now, if you're going to put on a spanning fixator, the ideal time to do the CT scan is after you've put on this fixator. Of course, if you're not putting on the fixator, that's a different situation. But the ideal time to do your uh, CT scan would be after you put on your spanning fixator, get some kind of provisional uh, reduction. And that gives you a much more ide better idea of the geometry of your fracture. Okay, so uh, the American mantra as they talk about span, scan, and then plan your fixation. 
Now, uh, Jitain touched this about the importance of CT scan. And this is a similar X-ray to the one he showed. Anyone looking at these X-rays would think that maybe this is not so bad a fracture. You get your CT scan and you can see the kind of depression there is there. And the reason why this sometimes shows is if you look at the periphery, it is okay. So on the X-ray, you are seeing the periphery. You're not seeing the depressed area clearly here. And you can see the kind of depression which involves more the anterior part, but there's a rim of bone there. So you don't see the classical depression that you would see in some of the X-rays. And that's why a CT is essential in deciding, especially once you've decided on operative treatment or you feel surgery is necessary, it's really important to get a CT and uh, so that you can plan your surgery possible. Uh, another thing that you need to look out for is in these uh, sort of uh, fractures where you have a split depressed, which doesn't look too bad, but these are the ones which have a very high incidence of meniscal injuries and very often the meniscus would be trapped in this fracture. Okay, so it's trapped in this fracture and it's you really have to bring it out and you can't actually reduce the fracture till you've got the meniscus out, brought it out, you repair it peripherally uh, and then you can go ahead and do your fracture fixation. Now, the important thing here is when you do your arthrotomy, it's a submeniscal arthrotomy, okay? And if you if the meniscus is gone, you'll be looking straight onto the femoral condyle. You will not see the meniscus, which is normally covering the femoral condyle when you're doing your submeniscal arthrotomy. And these split depressed fractures, you would then open out the window. You see the kind of depression there is, you would elevate it. And today, if you elevate it with a good amount of subchondral bone, as you can see here, you can fix these without having to put in graft, etc. But that's something we'll talk about later. The posteromedial fragment. This is another thing that has been more recognized recently. And uh, this was touched in the coronal plane fractures need to be recognized. They could be isolated as in this case, or it could be part of a uh, a fracture which involves both condyles or both sides or multiple condyles. Okay, and it's important again here to look at your X-rays carefully, look at your CT carefully. But if you look at the lateral X-ray, you can see there's subluxation of the femur posteriorly on the tibia. Okay, so you need to watch out for this, look at the X-rays, and you need to reduce this. And I think the approaches, etc., are going to be discussed later. But if you don't do it, you end up with this kind of fixation. You can see there's a lateral plate and a medial. Plate, but look at this double shadow. You can see that the posterior condyle is lying way down here while the anterior part of the condyle is there. You can see again the anterior part of the condyle there, the posterior part of the condyle there. So, And then later on, these become really challenging to try and reconstruct. So try and get things right the first time. Uh, the other controversy which I'll touch on briefly is whether a single lock plate is enough. Now, if you look at the fracture lines, it would depend to some extent on that. So if you have a fracture like this, and these slides are courtesy Dr. Badri from Liverpool, and you can see the different patterns of fractures here, the fracture lines that you need to look at, and then see how your plate and your screws are going to hold these fractures. So if you see these where you have a split across here or a split across there, it's very unlikely that your plate from across there is going to give you adequate fixation of your screws. So if it's a whole condyle involved, you can get multiple lock screws into the medial condyle and it may be enough. But if you have any doubt and have a split posteromedial area, then you're better off doing a double plating. And here the double plate, the medial plate is not a pure medial plate, but a posteromedial plate to buttress the posteromedial fragment. Okay, so that's the important thing. The other new other thing that we talk about is the subchondral screw fixation. I think initially we used to put cancellous screws and compress across the joint. We still want to compress across the joint, but to give good stable support to the articular area, we like to put these raft screws in the form of a raft. Now, uh, initially before the advent of the nice anatomical lock plates for the proximal tibia, we had our own methods of putting multiple 3.5 millimeter screws and then putting the plate on. But today with these uh, sort of uh, locking plates, which give you this option of four 
uh, sort of subcondral screws as raft screws. You don't need a separate uh, screw arrangement to support the articular area. You can do it with the plate itself. Uh, again, as was mentioned earlier, the plane of the fracture is important and some fractures, if you look at the CTs, will show you that there really is no anterior injury, okay? So there's no point putting a plate on the anterior side. Here your plate has to be posterior, okay? So here in this case, it was dead posterior. Again, these are going to be discussed in more details. Similarly, there will be situations where the injury is here on the posterolateral corda, okay? So there's nothing anteriorly also had an avulsion. And this fragment from here, believe it or not, was lying anteriorly. So we had to get this fragment out but to approach the fracture, we had to go posterolateral. There you can see the fragment here and the fracture where this fragment has come from. And you have to get the fracture fragment out. But here we used a fibula osteotomy. There are various approaches, again, which are going to be discussed in detail. Uh, but the important thing is to get the fracture reduced adequately and buttressed in the direction that the buttress plate needs to be. Okay, now there's still a role for definitive external fixation of frames. I think if you have situations like this where the articular injury is not so bad, there's a lot of soft tissue injury, you can treat them definitively in frames. Initially, you can span the knee if you require to. And then once the swelling comes down and you think you, can, you have enough stability with gluing of the fracture to mobilize the fracture, then you can take off the ring that is above the knee and start mobilizing the patient. Similarly, if injuries like this, uh, this was an open injury, you can treat definitively with minimal internal fixation and a, a fixator. And here we actually hinged the fixator after some time so that he could start mobilizing and he ended up with a very good result. So I think there's still a role for frames in some of these fractures and the Elisdorf fixator or hybrid fixators is definitely one option to deal with some of the very severe soft tissue injury patients. Uh, complications are there. You get wound problems. You can get compartment syndrome, malreductions, intra-articular and alignment. And here, the, uh, in a way, the alignment is just as or if more important even than the intra-articular uh, perfect reduction. So if your alignment is even a bit wrong, if you're in a little bit of virus, these patients tend to have problems earlier. Of course, infection is something you need to watch out. And malunions, if you have a malreduction, then you will end up. Non-unions are not so common, but we have seen a few non-unions involving the proximal tibia as well. So some of the controversies, uh, where, what is the need for locking plates? Is a single lateral lock plate enough? The incisions, the need for MRI. Now people are talking about doing what we call total uh, knee reconstructions, doing the bony and ligamentous reconstructions at the same time. And there they would do an MRI as well. Uh, we talked about the articular reduction as well. So in summary, I think the soft tissue management is really an essential part of your treatment and you cannot ignore this. Uh, uh, go by this general mantra of span, scan and plan. You need to get the articular surface restored as uh, well as possible and stabilized. Uh, use plating and today lock plates is the one which we would use most often for the dissociation between the metaphysis and the diaphysis uh, because it gives you a very stable fixation. Uh, but remember, you can still consider frames for complex fractures with a lot of soft tissue injury where you may not feel the internal fixation is safe or the soft tissue is such that you are worried about uh, putting in plates in that kind of situation. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, right. mm. So Thank there you is. Uh, yeah. yeah, Dr. Rajiv. Yeah. yeah, there is one question to Dr. John Rupakar there. Uh, Dr. Upender uh, from Bithia, he has asked that uh, how we can assess instabilities due to collateral injuries in proximal tibial fractures. Should we deal this problem in same sitting? Okay, so uh, this is a slightly controversial area. I think uh, by and large, uh, the trend has been to deal with the bony injury. So once you do your fix, you, because you can't clinically assess ligamentous laxity in a bad fracture, okay? It's simple as that, because it's going to be unstable. So it's only after you fix your fracture that you can assess a ligamentous instability. 
okay the meniscus the lateral meniscus usually you will see during surgery okay so if you are doing the proper approach using a submeniscal arthrotomy if there is a meniscal injury you will find it when you are doing your surgery similarly avulsions of the acl where there is a bony avulsion which has gone off you would deal with at the same time but other ligamentous injuries the general tendency has been to wait for the bones to settle and then do it today if you use titanium plates it doesn't get in the way of your mri to do later but as i mentioned there is a recent uh, uh, sort of trend uh, uh, which is also there uh, they have some courses in the ao on talking about total knee solutions in trauma where they want to deal with the bony and soft tissue or ligamentous injuries at the same time we're still not sure where this is going to lead uh, uh, this is uh, something which will be uh, clear over the next few years as to whether it's safe to do everything at one go or it's safer to deal with your bony injury and deal with the <coughs> problems the purely ligamentous problems at a later date if you have avulsions uh, ligamentous avulsions with bony fragments then of course you would deal with it at the same time okay uh, right sir uh, i think one another question from uh, dr shakti kishore he is assistant professor in nalanda medical college he has the question to dr john mukhopad there uh, kindly elaborate your approach on posterior lateral buttressing by posterior lateral approach okay so, so i think we uh, have got another topic yeah that is the topic yeah, i think so is we will uh, cover later if there is any uh, uh, sir there is one question from dr mahesh soni from gujarat is then we'll deal with it is there uh, any increased risk of joint infection after doing lateral meniscal arthrotomy uh, absolutely not okay because we do it as a routine if you do the lateral approach okay i think you're just why should you get more infection by doing an arthrotomy I, I, because i think as long as your theater conditions are okay there is no reason to get increased infection by doing an arthrotomy yeah? i think okay. it's important because you can't see the meniscal injury otherwise yeah one question from indor that uh, uh, while putting the wrap screw which you have mentioned Uh, sometimes it is very difficult that you have passed the wrap screw and then putting the plate. So can we put the wrap screw through the plate? Some of the plates yeah, so, like so, that. Yeah, so absolutely. So that's what I mentioned. I think the newer plates allow you to yeah. put the wrap screws through the plate. Yeah. So okay. The earlier plates did not allow it. Okay. So you had to make a separate way for it, and that's when the paper was published on that. It was before the advent of the newer plates, which actually allow you to put angle stable screws. which are even better than just simple screws uh, so you use that and if you can get your articular like i mentioned if you can get your articular uh, surface elevated with some subchondral bone you don't need to put in bone graft if there is no subchondral bone holding it then you need to put bone graft or bone substitute to support it so our incidence of bone grafting for proximal tibial fractures uh, over the last few years has gone down significantly we almost We very rarely do it. Yes, there are situations where we have to do it, but it's rare in fresh fractures. Okay. So your your thing is that if the sub control support is there, then we should not put bone graft. Even even the void is more. Exactly. So I mean, the void is not the issue. The void is if you have support for your fixation with your screws. Okay. So if when you elevate the articular surface, if you have enough sub control bone with it, your raft screws are going to hold it, and they're not going to allow it to. Down. So we don't actually uh, uh, we very rarely use bone graft or bone substitute today in fresh fractures, and I think so that's been with... a tendency throughout the world gradually. So, right. so there is yeah, one more question from YouTube, sir. Please. Uh, so for pure uh, split type fractures in statistical uh, type one, is there any way to predict whether the meniscus is trapped in the fracture, or do we always do a submeniscal or arthrotomy in the role of pre op MRI? Okay, so uh, so there is a role for MRI in some fractures, and I think the fractures which are minimally displaced and you have a lot of swelling, etc., you need to rule out uh, soft tissue injury. Okay, so the ones that we often do MRIs on are ones which the fracture is not so bad, but there is a lot of swelling and evidence of soft tissue injury where you suspect significant uh, soft tissue injuries, ligamentous injuries, etc. so i think that's the situation so if you have a split fracture without a depression the chances of the meniscus going into that are not so high 
It's the split depressed ones that very often have the meniscus in it. And the split fractures are relatively easy to treat. Uh, whether you need an MRI would depend on your clinic. Okay, sir. Uh, can we ask more questions or uh, later, sir? No, no. We will shift to Dr. Rita. Yeah. You can share your yeah. screen. In between the last question to Dr. John, you can share your screen in between. I said, Dr. John, sir, regarding the raft plate, the problem is that most of the raft plates have got 3.5 mm screws. So is yeah. it stable enough and that's strong enough? Yeah, so that's what they found that putting in four uh, 3.5 screws is actually better than putting two 6.5 screws. Right. Okay. Right. So they found, and but the important part of this is they will support it. Okay. Yeah. Only if yeah. you've got some nice subchondral bone which you're fixing it onto. Okay. That's important. Thank, thank yeah. you very much, sir. Now we have going to the next speaker, Dr. Rita Mittal, a very energetic, young, dynamic guy. And who will be talking about the radiological assessment and classification. Already we have gone to the complications. Now we are moving backwards, backwards, what Dr. John suggested. Let's come to the diagnosis part. Then we will have another, that is the approaches. So Dr. Rita. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, Bihar Orthopedic Association. And it's an honor to share the screen with my teacher, Dr. Maheshwari. I was the resident when Sir was assistant associate professor at Ames. And in my professional world, Dr. John has been a very good teacher. At the outset, I say, I say for the right decisions we need to take in life, we need the right information. And radiology is one of the first tools that we use to give us the right information. Just to revise a salient point in the anatomy that the lateral plateau and the medial plateau have certain fundamental differences. Bottom line is that for the medial to break, the violence required is higher. And the tibial plateau is narrower than the femoral distal articular width. So these are the two important things we have to remember. Because the medial condyle is hard and strong, it, tend, it generally tends to split. And the lateral being convex and softer tends to get depressed and spread out. So radiology basically helps define the personality of the injury like Dr. Maheshwari said, know your injury personality. That will help decide whether we want to fix it or not. Then will come the decision on where to give the incisions which Dr. Chatterjee will uh, educate us on. And radiology gives us an idea of what the prognosis is going to be before we even touch the patient. So the three tools that we have at our disposal are X-ray, CT, and MRI, all three of the same patient. The important thing here to note is that these findings are static. They will be like they are on day one, day five, day seven. The important thing like Dr. John showed is that the soft tissue injuries take precedence. And for soft tissue, it is history, clinical examination, and then radiology. So if there is any mismatch between history, clinical examination, and the X-ray, it should create a heightened awareness and the probability of using a higher investigative tool. Because if we miss the soft tissue injuries, like Dr. Maheshwari said, these are dynamic injuries. These are evolving. They are not apparent on day one. So if we slip on a banana peel and we ourselves are the bananas, then it adbut situation. It would be a very tricky situation. And uh, Dr. Maheshwari had alluded to this, that the x-ray will go all over the town and the city. So don't be a banana and slip over a banana. So we are all familiar with this classification. We must give credit to Dr. Schatzger who gave us this classification in 1974 when the only tool available was an X-ray. The controversy fundamentally is only in these two grades. So does Schatzger classification have a relevance in today's era? Absolute, absolutely, there is, it is still relevant. The only reason why we are able to see further ahead today is because we are standing on the shoulders of such giants. So this is an AP view. 
it looks like a Schatzger 4. So what does this tell us? If the resident sees this X-ray and tells us Schatzger 4, so I know that the violence has been significant. So I know this patient should not be planned for surgery the next day. I know that the probability of soft tissue injury is going to be high. So Schatzger is still relevant in our times, probably as a triaging tool in the early management of the patient. So there were some surgeons who, radio, who retrospectively analyzed a link, tried to analyze a link between radiology and the soft tissue. So the Schatzka grading was a crucial factor in quantifying the soft tissue injury. And the other thing they found out was, you have seen many x-rays like this, the midline of the femur and the midline of the tibia. So the further the separation, the higher the chances of associated soft tissue injuries. It could be ACL, PCL, MCL, LCL or closed compartment syndrome. So this is the degree of femoral displacement. And the second criteria they looked at is the maximum width of the femur and the maximum width of the tibia. So the higher the discrepancy, the more the tibial width, the higher the chances of associated soft tissue injuries. So this needs a heightened suspicion and repetitive clinical examinations. A CT scan will okay and MRI will give us the information, but a CT or MRI is not going to tell us about compartment syndrome. So radiology has to be complemented with clinical examination and where the fracture patterns look high energy injury, please be aware else like Dr. John had alluded to, we can miss common problems that we all can take care of very well, but once missed, it can become a challenge. So Schatzger classification, which is almost now 40, 44 years old, led to this concept of one condyle, one plate, and gradually over time, it became two condyles, two plates. So what was missing here is that some people were not doing well. After Schatzger came the AO classification and then came the upgraded AO OTA classification. Proximal femur is 41. Now, AO classification is an alpha numeric classification, very good for research purposes. So for the beginner who's not familiar and can get intimidated by the classification, ask yourself three questions. Does the fracture line enter the joint? And these classifications are based on X-rays, not on CT scans or MRIs. Does the fracture line enter the joint? If the answer is no, it's an extra articular fracture. So this is a 41A. Second question is, if the fracture line does enter the joint, ask yourself the second question, is any part of the articular surface continuous with the metadiaphysis? If the answer is no, that is the articular surface is separate and the diaphysis is separate, that is a C classification. That is a C type fracture where the articular surfaces of the lateral and the medial have no continuity with the shaft. So this is a type C fracture. And if there is a continuity, like you can see here, this is the medial condyle. It is continuous with the shaft. This becomes a B. So Schatzger 1, Schatzger 2, Schatzger 3, Schatzger 4 are all B type fractures. And there is hardly any controversy in that. All the controversy comes in the C type fracture where you ask yourself the third question. Is the articular fragment simple? or multi-fragmentary. This is the AP view of the previous patient. So this is a Schatzger 4. And in the AO OTA classification, this probably becomes a B, the highest possible grade in a B, that is B3.3. But the important thing here is if you note an asterisk, this asterisk basically is a qualifier. And in the qualifier, you can add that whether there is posterior ex extension of the fracture or not. So this is good. It is quite complex, 
very intimidating for the beginner but is it of any surgical relevance the answer is probably time will tell so what are x rays x rays are what the titanic captain saw in the sea he saw an iceberg and he felt that my ship is way beyond this size of this iceberg and it can cut through so yes x rays show us the fracture lines it shows us the course of the fracture lines it helps us identify fragments but x rays are two dimensional in tests and they have certain limitations the coronal plane injuries are less visualized and most of the complications that dr maheshwari showed dr john showed were missing or inadequately addressing the iceberg that is present beneath the surface of the sea so this is a shatzger era x ray showing a medial condyle fracture and three screws all going parallel to the fracture line so the ct scan the ct scan basically like this x ray was shown by dr john also similar looking x ray in opus looking x ray the ct scan basically shows the third dimension all is not well here so with ct scan and with more information came the column concept this was given by dr kongpeng lao from china who had analyzed the x rays and ct scans on 29 patients and they came up with this column classification and they basically divided the columns into three a medial column a lateral column and a posterior column the important thing here is the axial cut of the ct scan should be taken at the level of the head of the fulla because that becomes one of the important bony landmarks to distinguish between the lateral and posterior columns and the o here is the center of the tibial eminences in between the two tibial eminences the center so these are the two important points so to draw a line you need two points the anterior aspect of the head of the femur the center of the tibia and the tibial tuberosity so these were the bony landmarks they used and they gave this three column concept so the three column concept to really understand it we need not only the axial image we also need the coronal and sagittal formatting as well as the 3d reconstruction images so gather as much information as possible before venturing on to a uh, management so let's take some examples this is a very uncommon fracture pattern a zero column pattern very uncommon trivial injury patient has this x ray not able to walk left alone with time we start seeing the depression so these are zero column basically the shatzger type 1 generally seen in the osteoporotic patients so be aware in the osteoporotic osteoporotic patient who complains of inability to walk after trivial trauma and x ray can miss the injury a ct scan probably will show the injury but not show the true extent and mri will probably help in such cases showing extensive edema and it will raise heighten your awareness then come the one column fracture so if you see this red hemisphere so this is a basically a convex shape so the lateral condyle is convex so this is the classical split with depression the shatzger type 2 the split with depression that we see one of the most common fracture patterns now this is an isolated posterior column fracture where we it's the entire fracture line is all posterior the x ray is going to be looking normal in the ap view and this again is a very uncommon fracture pattern an isolated small medial condyle fracture which like dr maheshwari had said you see funny patterns when you see funny patterns think something is not right so this was an isolated small medial condyle fracture which had depressed coming to two column fractures the lateral and the posterior so when the shatzger type 
fracture line is extending up to the posterior column like in this case so this becomes a lateral as well as a posterior column fracture the good thing is that the posterior column has not displaced or depressed now this is the classical schatzger type 4 two column where we see where we see the medial condyle and the posterior column getting involved and this again is a very uncommon fracture pattern an isolated anterior medial and a lateral posterior column i have not seen one so far probably this is where dr maheshwari's hyper extension injuries may fall in coming to the three column all the three columns so this fundamentally is the most column most common and the hotly debated injuries the schatzger 5 and 6 the good thing is that there, there is no controversy 5 and 6 are three column schatzger tells us that this is a bad injury the three column tell us it's a bad injury so the wise thing is like dr john said wait so tbl plateau gives us time to wait and waiting gives us time to think and when we have time to think we must use it wisely so what the three column classification has done is basically given emphasis on the posterior column and in our course looking ap view a lateral view showing post posterior fragments the ct scan showing it clearly so basically the three column classification has changed our thinking from two condyles to three columns and the second thing that the ct scan has done is gives us the fracture morphology or the personality of the injury now what does one mean by morphology morphology means the fragment size the fracture lines the relation of the fracture lines to each other and more importantly the cortical apices of the fracture because that is the place where the buttress plate needs to be applied at the apex of the fracture so when we talk of the posterior column this again like the medial and lateral has two fragments the posterior medial the stronger one which is weight bearing in flexion combination we know here is uncommon and failure is by shear so it just needs a buttress and the posterior lateral the ap view in the ct scan looking good and then we start seeing something not right so the purely posterior and lateral injury which then needs a separate device not only to hold it up but keep it there the approaches dr rajiv will let us know so the ct scan also can give us an idea of the soft tissue injury schatzger is relevant in terms of triaging ct giving us more information can make us more aware so to answer a question which was asked previously if one sees articular depression more than 5 6 mm and widening of the condyles more than 5 mm have a high index of suspicion for meniscal injury and associated ligamentous injuries a example similar to dr john's case where on incision the mid the lateral meniscus was actually stuck below in the depressed fragments and we could see the bare femoral condyle so even before going ahead for surgery you can be aware that you are going to have some challenges so be aware of them coming to mri a study done showed that when an x ray is taken and a ct scan done subsequently the diagnosis changed in 6% patients but when an x ray was combined with mri the diagnosis was changed in almost of 50 20% of the patients but were these diagnosis change clinically relevant the answer is probably no because surgical management is still based on ct scan so we have to image what we have to fix and what we end up fixing are bones in stage 1 of the surgery the ligamentous injuries if they are evulsed with bone can be tackled there and then or subsequently so the take home here is that the proximal tibia beware of soft tissue injuries and the schatzger classification is still valid as a triage tool in the emergency and the initial management of the patient the ao classification is very exhaustive and valid for research purposes 
the ct scan is an absolute essential if you are going to go ahead and do surgical management of this patient and the three column classification has enhanced our understanding and it's a very surgically relevant classification to use thank you uh, thank you dr rita very well expressed elaborated and made very easy for most of the viewers uh, the thing is that uh, regarding ct scan 2d and 3d what do you feel i mean everybody should push for 3d picture or 2d you are uh, sure enough to manage it properly uh, 3d is because on the human body during the surgery what you actually are seeing is 3d reconstruction right mm -hmm. on body mm -hmm. so there is even talk and we had a thesis in our uh, university uh, hospital where we did 3d bone modeling of the fractures so when we showed the candidates the axial cut the sagittal cut and gave them the 3d model it right. enhanced the understanding of the fracture pattern okay. so for example if i have to put a screw from medial to lateral or lateral to medial i know i should not use a long screw initially proximally it may interfere in the subsequent reduction from the other side so that's how 3d helps mm -hmm. dr amulya may I just interrupt yeah yeah sure sure now uh, i think this question which you asked in the beginning about ct mm -hmm. uh, i know in cities more or less it is accepted by surgeons who have good practice who patient doesn't mind paying have no inhibition about getting a ct done in these cases but i am sure there are peripheries where everything is under constraint for example sending a patient to ct scan means sending him 50 100 kilometers yeah right so that's where surgeon starts thinking whether i should or i should not so yes. i think one clear message this webinar should give is yes. don't touch the patient if you cannot get a ct scan please accept not doing surgery on that 20 30% patients where right. you will actually mess him up so ct is a must if you are going to operate yes. now about right. the 2d 3d i want to say one word that mm -hmm. 3d i do 3d 2d ct in lot of fracture situations right. i think particularly in upper tibial fracture is very important yes. why it is important is you have to see the tongue of the fracture But it's a buttress right. system all the time, mm -hmm. and you have to put your buttress exactly where the tongue of that fracture is in relation to the shaft. That you cannot see in 2D and uh, 2D. Even in sagittal coronal, you cannot. You can only see it in a 3D. Where exactly is the tongue? Where exactly your plate is going to be? Because on that will depend your approach. There are too many complications in this fracture. If you want to put a plate posteriorly, you have to open from posterior, which means position prone. There are too many things. So if you do not know exactly where you are going to put your plate, which you can only know from 3D CT scan, right. then you will mess up the case. Very very yeah, I think, yeah. message. I think yeah. both are important. You need to have the 2Ds to understand the depressions, etc. Yeah, right. and right. your overall uh, sort of uh, plane of your fracture fixations. The CT actually gives you a much better idea. So I think so this is a question the to Dr. John from YouTube channel. What is the basis to decide between bone graft and bone graft substitute? There's a question from Janki Sharan Badani. So today, for fresh fractures, we almost uh, firstly, like I said, we don't use bone graft or substitutes unless uh, there's a situation where we are not having any subchondral bone below the articular surface. And today, we would generally use bone substitute uh, unless. for some reason the patient uh, can't afford it and we take bone graft because we don't charge separate right may i ask ritab ritab one question can i ask yes, you sir sir as you know we are always struggling with uh, expenses and ct or no ct do you think there is a shortcut to saving that money yes like a traction view maybe oblique views where in at least 20 30% patient you can do away with ct But that's a pressure. Sir, sir, I don't I have hundred percent CT everywhere. I have got uh, my solution to that is, I have uh, two or three centers whom I have talked to. I send them patients who can afford, right? And I also send them patients who cannot afford. And those who cannot afford, I do not ask for films. I get it on a CD, and I get it for as less as thousand rupees in Delhi. Okay. CD, CT, with all the images I want. So X-ray is six hundred yeah. rupees. So sir, we have to find our way around, sir. Because if I am going to operate, I need the information. If I don't have the information and I 
cause more harm. Mm. It's violating that first principle of do no further harm. <clears throat> Very good, Doctor Rajiv. You want to have your say? Yeah, the way I have, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The way I have worked it around with my hospital is, see, the head CT, the simple cranial CT is uh, fifteen hundred, and the three D CT is five thousand something. So I just told them this patient can can you just put it as a cranial CT? So mm -hmm. cranial CT is in one plane. So while he's doing a CT scan, I go to the console. Is a, I'm just next to the console. See it in my mind. Draw my pictures, and the printout given to him is just a single plane cut. But I have seen all the cuts myself. So that's the way I have worked. So we have all have to work out our own. So 1500 rupees, you can't afford it. He gets it instead of 5500. Don't tell such secrets on YouTube on this channel. Because my office later may be listening. Uh, yeah, GM is not watching. Sorry, I got question. I got disconnected for some time. Yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. There is a question to Doctor John, sir, from Milan Joshi. Are you really satisfied all the time by tying the lateral meniscus to holes in the raft plate? Uh, it appears flimsy at times. No, I don't. I don't repair the lateral meniscus to the holes. You have to. Okay. So you you repair the lateral meniscus. To the to the uh, femoral side, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you repair it to the femoral side, okay. So you don't um, put the uh, repair from the meniscus onto the holes in the plate. It's the capsule that at the end you will repair to the holes on the plate. Okay. okay. Uh, so we will be moving towards the next speaker in between, Doctor Rajiv. If there is any question, you can ask. Uh, and uh, Doctor Rajiv Chatterjee, you can come with uh, slide share. Dr. Rajiv, our secretary, is there any yeah, question? Yeah. A lot, lot of people have inhibition about lifting the meniscus. I can right. understand. To cut the meniscus, where will it go? And they're, they're worried about all kind of meniscal injuries. So, I think the, the assurance is periphery of the meniscus is a very vascular structure. Yeah. After fixing, we just put one stitch, which does not let it displace, which it will not, it will just heal up. Because it's a very, very vascular area. So don't worry about lifting the meniscus and re-suturing it. It's not a big deal. And, and when you're doing your submeniscal arthrotomy, you're actually not uh, cutting the meniscofemoral side of it. Yes. It is, yes. Don't open the joint above the meniscus. Yeah. Open the joint right. below the meniscus. No, no, no. Meniscofemoral part of it is still intact. Okay, And then you're just repairing what is left of that with the capsule onto the plate. If, uh, uh, that's the answer for the previous question. I was talking about when the meniscus is torn then you have to repair it first before you do this suture onto the plate. Sir, there is one more question from Dadgushan Badane, sir. Significance of increase of coronal diameter in AP view. Do we need to correct it? Yes. So who's that to? Yeah, no, that has to be absolutely corrected because any widening would lead to incompetence of the collateral ligaments. And out of the ACL, PCL, and MCL, and CL, the collateral ligament stability is more important than the anterior posterior stability. So you have to reduce the typical widening. It has so, to be reduced. Yeah, so that's an interesting mm -hmm. thing. Uh, definitely, you have to do that. But there are some of these fractures, especially some of the medial condyle fractures, where it's sometimes really difficult. And uh, I still haven't always solved this problem. Uh, so maybe we can discuss that at the end. Can I give a tip on this? Uh, yeah. For a beginner, it is a good idea to have an image view of the normal site yeah. on one of the view box or maybe a normal x-ray. And when you are reconstructing, that should be a reference point all the time. So one last question, sir. How to decide low angle and high angle lateral tibial plates? What is that? <laughs> okay, so I think I think I know what he's trying to say there. Yeah. Uh, the A uh, so the synthesis has in the 3.5 millimeter system two types of plates. One which has a slightly bigger uh, sort of a bend to it than the uh, other one. So for Indian patients, usually the low ones are usually uh, more suitable than the high ones. Okay. So there is a question from Dr. Saket Jati from Indore, the secretary of Madhya Pradesh Orthopedic Association. What is the experience of faculty to use wrapped screws in depressed displaced sagittal plane fractures? Your experience as such. Wrapped screws. 
So he is talking about independent screws from front only to back. Screws, only screws. Only screws. Yeah, so so for the medial condyles, sometimes I do that. Most often, I try to buttress it as well. Yeah, right. But uh, uh, yes, there are times when I've just done front to back two or three screws. But uh, usually, I would try to buttress it posterior medially as well. Right. Uh, can I just one point to that raft screw? Can I add? Yeah, sure, sure. No, sure. Uh, so ba uh, basically, I had uh, two couple of years ago, we had gone to a meeting and Casper and he's done some study on this. The use of 6.5 screws too close to the surface can cause necrosis of the cartilage. And that is one of the reasons they have shifted to a 3.5 system. A 6.5 screws between uh, uh, about one centimeter, within one centimeter of the articular cartilage has been shown in the long run to cause articular necrosis. Be aware of using a 6.5. That's, that's what he's published it. He's looked at long-term use of 6.5 screws, long-term 10 years down the line, and they have found a higher rate where there's a reason they've shifted to a 3.5 system. Now it's just can a I, don't use a 6.5. Can I make a comment? I think this raft screw business is a, a concept in itself. It's yeah. not raft, raft screw. It is a raft yeah. principle. Of supporting the bundle. You can do raft principle even with K-wires. Okay. Two, three K wires which hold there. It is like something like a girder holding that. Sometimes you cannot put even a screw, which is okay. Put two, three, four K wires just to support in the subcondyl bone. If you can use an independent wrap screw, it's okay. Or through the plate, it's again okay. Or even simply K wires. It's just rafting that fragment, not to let it collapse. That's good, good idea, sir. Now we will shift towards this Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee. Knowing about the different uh, radiological aspect coming to a diagnosis, what are the different approaches to proximal tibia fracture? Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. <clears throat> Rajiv and my seniors, John Maheshwari. Learned a lot today. And Ritab, of course, is a brilliant presentation. So it's easy for me to go along. Now from here, next few minutes we'll discuss is this was 2003 to 4. We thought life was very simple at that point of time. Um, I had this idea that you could, you had one answer to all the problems. And my one answer I thought was this. And this is 2003, four. And unfortunately what we're missing out was this corner, sorry. This corner fragment, this coronal little back fragment is missing. And as John has already said, is never a single answer to all these complex problems. So with this, I carry on with the next bit, which Ritab has already brought forward, how important CT scan is, so important to identify the fragments, get your, uh, your columns, your lateral, medial, posterior column identified. That is required to plan your approach, plan your implant placement. Well brought out by Lou. And from the three, it's come to a four column now. So basic idea <clears throat> is that you need to identify all the subsets of your fractures. You need to identify what approaches to use. You need to identify what implants to use so that you have a stable assembly. At the end, a reasonably good articular surface and more importantly, what Dr. Maheshwari said today, the best possible metaphysial angle. So basically the articular surface to metaphysis, the alignment has to be perfect. Only way you can get it is by addressing every little corner, which we will discuss regarding what position to use, what approach, and how to fix them. So we start off with a standard anterolateral, the, uh, the normal one, which is the most common approach. Simple skin, subcutaneous tissue, uh, incision based on Jordi's tubercle, distally over the anterior compartment, paracrystal. You can angulate it toward the lateral femoral condyle or the fibular head. The difference is if my work is going to be a bit more posterior, you angle it more posterior, then the, the skin does not get into the way of your incision. Keep the knee in 30 degree flexion, deep incision, split the IT band, raise the, the anterior compartment in L-shaped fashion. And we have discussed this uh, arthrotomy and do a incision, submeniscal arthrotomy, raise the uh, you know, meniscus up. Even if it's not trapped, I all, in all these depressed fractures, I do this arthrotomy, put two, two ethibonds, one anterior, one middle or posterior, 
leave a bit of tissue on the anterior. There is some question about how we reattach them back. Leave a bit of tissue on the anterior aspect. In the middle aspect, there's nothing to reattach onto. These as guides to hold your meniscus up to look into the articular surface. Later on, to attach them onto the plate. Uh, this has been well brought. Uh, this has been done as an experimental model in, uh, uh, you know, in dogs, and has been done way back in 1995. Described. So let's look at a case. So this is, I've gone straight to the case with CT scan, the dipless fragment, T fragment, there's an incision. It is a bit, uh, it is angled towards a fibular head. And as you see, that is the meniscus, the top part. There are two ethibonds, or two ethibonds holding the meniscus up. You see into the joint, this is a depressed fragment. You have flipped the, uh, the, P, uh, the fracture fragment out, raise this depressed fragment up from the bottom, then hold it with temporary screws. Then close it down here and then apply the plate and tie the ethibonds through the screws and through the soft tissue in the front. So leave a bit of soft tissue for your attachment here and the rest too through the holes. And that should give you a secure fixation for the lateral con uh, condyle, which is different. So this is the x ray on table, submeniscal arthrotomy, direct visualization, elevation, drafting, support. Step by step. When does we think of, when do we think about a posterior medial approach? Is when obviously we have a, a medial uh, fracture, posterior medial fracture. Remember, if you are doing an anterolateral approach along with it, you need a wide separation, and we'll get through with a couple of cases. You can do them supine. Uh, you can do them prone. Uh, supine, you need to have the knee extend, rotated, and flex, and you're literally working from behind. It's much easier to do them prone because the knee in extension reduces the fracture and is a posterior to anterior fixation. Sorry. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. My internet is... Oh, sorry, sorry. No, no. It's okay. Internet suddenly, suddenly played up. Internet suddenly... So uh, the advantage of the prone position is that the skin flaps do not hinder screw fragments and you are in a natural plane of fixation, which is posterior to interior, anterior. So we start with the first case. It's a pure posterior medial fracture in varus internal rotation. The second case, as you see, is a slightly more com complex. It's a axial loading with a knee inflection. And you see this force has gone all the way up to the lateral side. It started medially all the way lateral side. It's a full posterior condyle is completely fractured. The case three is a, com is a combination of everything. Looks in aqueous and x-ray, but look at the CT scan. You have a medial condyle split. You have a posterior condyle split and a lateral condyle split. So basically, it's a global fracture, and you have a uh, you have a fracture in all three planes. And this is a 3D CT, by which you can see that this will need a different thought process from case number one. Case number four, a bit more complex, where along with these fractures, this combination, the metaphyseal level, and the fifth one we will discuss is the pure posterior lateral fracture which we will see with the CT. So starting again, posterior medial, the case number one, supine position, limb external rotated, simple uh, approach. You start the incision along the posterior border tibia, curve it proximally in a reverse L-shaped fashion, see the fascia, split the fascia, work between the gastrocnemius and the, sorry, work between the gastrocnemius and the pes, Sometimes I have had to make a small nick in the pest, which I've repaired. There is talk about whether I put the plate on the P. I put my plate on the MCL. I do not strip the MCL. So the plate comes posteriorly, clamp it with a large reduction forceps. See it on C arm. It is a buttressing plate alone. You need to buttress the little corner and that will reduce. You do not need to see the articular reduction in this fracture as Ritab has already said. The fracture here is usually a high force, but it splits. The articular surface does not shatter. It's a reverse in the lateral side. Now the second case, in which we'll see in this in a prone position, it's easier to do it. The skin incision again along the middle of the gastrocnemius. We will be able to make a lot more lateral side, you know, exposure in this position. We do it prone, and these are reserved mainly for the pure posterior injury where we might have to do a lot of lateral work as we will see in the cases. 
So reduction here happens in extension. The metaphysis, article, the article reduction is not important. The metaphysis reduction is important. Check under Siam, use an anticlide plate. And the important thing is to buttress the apex of the fracture. So starting from case number one, it was a pure posterior injury, posteromedial injury. So a simple supine position, the one we saw, posteromedial approach, and a simple plate, posteromedially was enough. Case number two, a simple single plate would not be enough. We would not be able, this plate would be able to get this area. But what about this area? This area would remain vacant. So in this case, we went prone, as we showed before, a much more lateral extension to our incision, peeled. So we walked between the gastrocnemius and the pes, peeled the popliteus off to the lateral edge. So we could go actually up to the lateral edge, you see here, up to the lateral edge of the tibial plateau and used one plate for the lateral side and one for the posterior medial side. So this is say the one plate, so this is peeling off till this area. So this plate was buttressing this area and the posterior medial plate was buttressing this area. And this actually what looks medial is actually posterior in the lateral view. So both plates are posterior and because it's a large fragment and this area bears a large amount of load and Dr. Meshwari said, what is in process of 3D is this, that I need my plates buttressing both the apices. It has an apice here, it has an apex here. So both the apices have to be buttressed. So you need two plates to buttress this area and much more extensive exposure. In case three, because it was a combination of a posterior, which was extending on, as you see, it has got a apex here, an apex here, an apex here, three apices. I need to buttress all three apices. And if you look at the uh, you know, axial cut, you need to get in from this side, you need to get in from this side, you need to get from this side. You need to place all three. I did my first work in a prone position because I'm not vertical. I'm not very comfortable doing a lazy, you know, floppy lateral. Somehow I'm never going to get my alignment right in my head. So I did this in a prone position first, put my plates in, my posterior plate in, my medial plate in, so I buttressed. So uh, what I did first was I buttressed this area first from the back, then this area, uh, sorry, this area from the back, then this area with this plate, this to this plate, and then got the patient supine. I know it's a bit cumbersome. My initial is, uh, was not very happy and then put a lateral plate. So this plate came in last to hold this area. So again, this, First, this was buttressed by this plate. Then this was buttressed by this plate, both prone using the posterior medial approach, extended along, closed the wound, then went, uh, put, uh, put the patient supine, and then went through the standard anterolateral incision and put this plate on. This is difficult doing it with a supine position because in the supine position, getting your this plate from this approach is difficult. You really can't twist your leg around. That is where a floppy lateral works, but I'm not very comfortable doing it. That's the reason I do it prone first and then go do a supine lateral. This is how it looks in the lateral position. The type four, here I analyzed that in a, if you look at the uh, posterior medial fragment, it was a small posterior medial fragment and it's a large anterolateral fragment. So here I went supine because I had to dial in between both these. So because this combination here, I need to distract it out. First, get my posterior medial fragment in, put a provisional one screw, one screw, getting it yanked out. But then this wasn't sitting right. So I had to loosen the screw, go back in, get this fragment aligned in, put a couple of screws to hold it together, then put a provisional fixation on the lateral side then went in medial side, complete them fixation, came back and did. So it was working both sides, but this was done in supine position, anteromedial, anterolateral plate. And this is how it was done. So I was dialing in between these two, so these two plates, dialing in my fixation. So the whole work was done supine, anteromedial, anterolateral, uh, and posteromedial approach. Again, repeating posteromedial and anterolateral approach, supine position, dialing in as I went along. These are difficult because the combination, metaphysical combination is what is always a bugbear and so difficult to get them reduced. 
There are enough papers way back in 1994, if you add two incisions, a posteromedial and an anterolateral, as long as you have a four to five centimeter gap between them, as long as you do your, respect your soft tissues properly, as you do not undermine, you should be okay. Using the old Mercedes uh, skin incision, I have seen when I was training, have never used it. Those were after disasters personally. So I'm very comfortable doing a posteromedial and an anterolateral incision separately, maintaining a bridge of five centimeter to six centimeter skin bridge at least. Now coming to the posterolateral, lateral, they are always done in the prone position. If it's a pure posterolateral lateral injury, as in this case, this is how the CT scan looks like. Pure posterolateral lateral depression, prone position, mark my fibula, mark my joint line, incision going straight across. Uh, here I have, uh, isolated my nerve just and the nerve is so superficial you open the skin subcutaneous tissue feel for the biceps and the nerve is just there so tag the nerve then you look at the inferior genital artery which i have tied you can see it is a nice big branch which goes across nice you have tied it you know burnt it cut it and then raise the soleus off from the fibula head then gone into the popliteus raised it off this is lateral to medial in the posterior medial, did medial to lateral. Here's lateral to medial. And you can see as you sweep the popliteus off, you see the posterior medial fragment, which I've raised. Here I've used uh, bone, uh, you know, bone substitute and then put a T plate. The problem with this approach is because you get only about four to five centimeters because the anterior tibial artery just arches across here and goes from posterior to anterior or into the intramuscular septum. So you cannot go beyond the intramuscular septum and there's a very tight band you feel, do not go beyond that, so it's four to five centimeters. So the plate that you use is a very small plate, a small distal radius plate is the maximum you can use in this plate, place and do not go distally beyond that because you can't damage or you can uh, tighten up the anterior artery as it is going through the intramuscular septum. After this, you've repaired all your tissues and have come out. Now, in 2010, Frosch came up with this idea. I mean, I personally have never done a fibula osteotomy. I know John has done loads of them. I'm very wary about doing fibula osteotomy. If you get a case wherein you have to look at the lateral fracture, both from the front and the back. Fibula osteotomy obviously is the best. I'm a bit worried about doing fibula osteotomy. That's the reason I love doing a Frosch approach. It's a lateral position. I just make a slight curve anteriorly, curve it slightly anteriorly. Actual Frosch is much more lateral. If I do it anteriorly, because it's easier to raise the front fragment off, raise the flap, okay? And this is the biceps, dissecting the nerve out. So you take the nerve out and the biceps anteriorly, the same way I did a posterior lateral, did my work posterior, uh, uh, you know, posteriorly with this plate here, and then came anteriorly, raised it in a normal L-shaped fashion and put my this plate on. So this fractures has been reconstituted both from the back and the front using the Frosch approach, lateral position, incision lateral, you can work both posteriorly and anteriorly. So it's been a march through the ages, 2003, four, I think, I'm not very sure, I just picked up from old files, it's my own case, where I did this thinking, and this was, this was the thought process that with this plate, you can grab any fragment on the medial side. To 2017, where we have chased every little fragment by two incisions, posteromedial, anterolateral, and got my plates in, getting a reasonable articular attack, uh, reduction, but more importantly, getting the metaphyseal reduction. These were two words which Shaska in that conference had come up with, and it was a fantastic lecture he gave. He spoke about this big screws be, being put too close to the fracture that we were discussing, and second thing, and Dr. Maheshwari has brought it out so well, that the metaphyseal alignment is the most important thing. Articular reduction is important. But the most important thing is the metaphyseal alignment, which has to be reconstituted and held solidly till fracture union, which you can do only when you have gone and attacked every little corner. So at the end, I want to say identifying every fragment is important reduce and fix through the approach depending on the fragment, posterior, medial, anterolateral are the workhorse. Recently, the posterolateral 
and the Frosch approach, raft the subchondral bone after reduction, anti-glide for the metaphyseal fracture, position and number of the plate will depend on the fracture geometry, but you need to get your metaphyseal alignment right and that needs to be supported well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for bringing out all the different approaches and really is good because now we are considered about the different fragments and which are fragment first is the thing. Again, we were discussing in our different case presentation as such. Just only one thing regarding your posterior approach. You mentioned about that you want to apply some bone substitute. You applied a bone substitute in one of your cases. What is your experience the experience when you're applying? Yeah. The postal lateral approach, but the postal lateral yeah. approach, because that's just usually a sliver of bone which is settled down. And when you raise it up, there's a huge void there. And the, the implant that we use that we have is not the same implant we have in the lateral side. We have a very flimsy little implant. And that is right. the reason we put the bone substitute because the implant is not enough to hold it up. And what do you know Correct me, John. When you're using bone substitute regarding infection. We are now afraid of infection, especially any of the bone substitute. So what is your experience when you are using it? Luckily, touch wood. I have not used many, mainly the postal lateral approach has a huge void in the lateral side. Touch right. wood. I haven't had any infection right. with the post with uh, bone substitute. I have had skin dehiscence. I have had problems where I have not followed my principles right, but right. not with the bone substitute. I'm very specific about it. I, I should not be naming them. I do not use the, any bone substitute. I use one particular bone substitute. Shall not name it. Fine. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Rajiv uh, uh, if the fragment is little more posterior, uh, then do you feel any difficulty by giving by going to one approach straight away? Uh, you're talking about a lateral side or the lateral, lateral side? Lateral side. Lateral side, if it's, if, if it's a lateral side with a lateral, that's the reason you, you can go with the standard lateral approach, you angle it to the fibula head, you strip your muscles off and actually you can go to the back, little to the, if you look at the tibia, you can go up to the two third, just in front of, just behind the fibula head. You cannot go beyond that by the lat standard lateral approach. But if you're in doubt, if you have a problem, keep the patient lateral, do the frost approach, you do the front part. If you have a problem, go from the back. Yes. The frost, you can go front back as you want. Back, yes. yeah. Dr. Rajiv, so, there is a question for you uh, from the YouTube. I'm not getting the name, but it is that for the anterolateral approach, how often to use the femoral distractor? There is the idea that it helps in reduction by hinging the joint upon the medial condyle. Do you routinely use them? I routinely keep it. But it is mainly for a metaphyseal combination that you use it. The problem is if you have a posterior fracture, you cannot work with the distractor. Play an anterolateral, yes. This is a lot of metaphyseal combination. I will first open the fracture, do my right. submeniscal arthrotomy, do my articular work, try to pull it out, see if the metaphysis is very badly communicated, then use the distractor to hold it and then pass it. Yeah. Okay. There's a question from Dr. Janki Sharan Bhadani. Deep closer near proximal end of plate in anterolateral approach, almost very difficult. Anything that you want to do when you are having deep? a deep closer of that anterolateral approach, proximal end of the plate, especially. Proximal of the plate. Uh, no, yeah. see, that's the reason. When you start off with first incision, as I said, you plan. If your fracture, the lovely question he asked, if you're going to not going to go too much back, do an incision which is aiming towards the uh, lateral femoral condyle, right? Make a generous incision. You're not doing minimal invasive. Get down to the fascia, single to the fascia. Raise the flap up to the fascia, single. Then you go to the muscle. Second, so first, skin subcutaneous tissue fascia, one flap. Second is the muscle flap. Third is your submenisal arthrotomy. And come out closing in that, in that way. Never had a problem. I don't know things were and don't go too early. Very important. Don't go too early. It's very right. swollen. Wait, wait, okay. wait. Patient might go off to somebody else. I'm happy. The other day I've lost a patient. They called me up about 200 kilometers away. I told them you have to come in. You have to wait, sir. We have no place to stay in this day of lockdown. I said, unless you get a place to stay, I will put an X fix on. You go somewhere, stay, come back to me after some weekends. 
and i'm quite uh, generous with my expectations i think one one tip in using the lateral plate particularly yeah yeah these are very bulky plates they are mm-hmm. probably meant for people who are 6 feeters and sometime when the patient is you know 5 feet it is a very bulky plate and if you do not actually get it deep into your just in front of the fibula by going extra dissection it becomes palpable superficially it's very very irritating for the patient to feel it there so when you are putting that plate make sure that just to get that bloody thick plate inside you have to dissect deep even if it is not required just to get the plate plate buried adequately okay right and also you are not always able to close the fascia okay so if you can't yeah. close the fascia there's a lot of tension on trying to close the fascia just don't close the fascia almost never yeah never no don't close almost the fascia subcutaneous tissue just couple of subcutaneous tissue is, and yeah. yeah but in your answer to his question you said you close them layer oh, by layer no no layer by what i meant was don't yeah. do that layer yeah. by layer coming out yeah. sorry coming out right a uh, what did you trick which i learned from john basically was a, a, about a couple of years ago and you know when the reduction bit so when you raise the little fragments of bone up you put kys and this is a com- combination of dr maheshwari and john put kys through each fragment and take it out to the medial side it will just come out flush so you don't see the kys but they are holding each fragment and they coming to the medial side sorry i didn't take um, i asked told somu to take those pictures he never took them so we worked <laughs> together that's a good trick but that's a good trick because a lot of people struggle once yeah. they yeah, that's the wire, they cannot put the plate yeah. so, so that's you know, the, the best is to john get all wires on the other side saving the needle side. the bundle john thanks john for the trick i told talked to <laughs> years ago yeah right yeah. thank you very much dr rajiv now actually we have got time for those case discussion for all the faculties whatever typical cases difficult cases or what you felt in your private practice what can be good uh, message to the our viewers can we start from dr john first so i thought you had a case uh, amulya uh, no no sir i don't have sir okay you you take it so uh, has anyone got a case yeah. out i, I think uh, uh, from juna agar one person has sent a case i think uh, some will... yes i'll share uh, after a talk sir yeah talk is over you know yeah so talk sir any questions we take any questions and then we can do that any more questions we have two cases from uh, yes anand sir and i'll just share in this sir yeah one question dr k s anand one case he has presented but unfortunately dr. yes okay sir. right one is coming uh this question is a case from dr k s anand uh So question what are the different approaches for uh, post lateral fragment fixation and their potential uh, danger in this case sir okay so does he have a ct we don't have a ct sir so again i, I mean uh, so the approach is either with or without an osteotomy i think uh, rajiv showed the one without the osteotomy the other way is to do a fibula osteotomy in the level of the neck and you elevate the superior part along with the biceps tendon and the lateral collateral ligament okay yes. so biceps femoris and that really gives you the best visualization you can get of this area of course you have to take care of the uh, common peroneal nerve as it comes posteriorly across the neck okay so that is something you have to be careful of and then the fixation a little bit of a problem so you can either use screws or tension band wire fix your fibular neck osteotomy and then uh, you can combine it with the anterior approach as in the frosh that you can do with or without the osteotomy okay so you can do both these things it will give you an excellent visualization of the posterior area uh, which definitely is better with the osteotomy but a lot of the work in some of the simpler cases can be done without the osteotomy but where you need a uh, real clear exposure of this corner then the osteotomy really helps you okay so uh, only thing that you need to watch out there for is this and in the posterior approach of the anterior tibial artery because about 6 cm from the joint line this artery goes in between the fibula and the tibia and if you injure that that's a problem so the lateral posterior lateral is restricted by the fact of this vessel you can't put large plates on the posterior lateral area so one tip i would like to give here is yeah look at the normal side of this patient if this patient has a valgus knee on the other side and you leave it in valgus and little more valgus it's a problem forever 
and you know this fracture is commutative whatever you may do you will not come out very satisfied with fixation so what i often do in such cases is i put a spanning fixator for 6 weeks you know keeping it in varus with the fixator on the lateral side in the femur in the tibia because i don't want it to go into where well by any chance and with the kind of chura you know the multiple pieces they are i would not depend on any plate nothing i would put a spanning fixator and i understand immobilizing for 6 weeks actually doesn't matter i don't want this leg to go into valgus by any means it is asked uh, yeah but you have this fragment here with the articular surface in it okay so yes, it's, all, it's all variable sometimes it is in multiple pieces you're not yeah, but this is a nice articular surface and you need to get that reduced to this area okay yeah. after so that the joint is sublux so you need to do that and then how you fix it if you want to put it put a fixator across it and just put a couple of screws into it that's an option that you may well, i'm saying i'm saying fixator in addition to the best possible fixation in terms of if you can supplement your internal supplement, supplement. with an external fixator we do that once in a while yeah. and the good the good thing is it's got a nice metaphyseal beak if you can see yeah, the lateral yeah no but here you, here you have to get this articular surface reduced i yeah. think just this articular surface right the beak is not going to do it for you so sir no, i'm uh, saying but the good news that's not shattered so this is the inlet posterior excess sir this coming of the inlet posterior excess sir yeah so it's okay but i would be a little worried about this yeah because this buttress of the plate is not i mean it doesn't look perfect on the x rays i don't know maybe you better feel of yeah uh, the, again i think this is the problem this this has got two apices possibly the posterior apex and a antero lateral apex yeah, yeah. you see that, that is the reason the ct is required without that, that is the ct was a must it is a must so i think he has done ct evaluation but uh, uh, he has not given not the ct up. so what approach has he used for this i think by seeing the frosh so looks like a frosh to me yeah frosh frosh the frosh so the incision looks from back here to the front here yeah so it looks I like a frosh approach but he yeah. hasn't used that whatever, whatever approach where you want to put your plate it should be possible i don't yeah. think there's any rule about which approach of, even if you have to osteotomize if your apex is where your plate has to be full stop whatever way you want to do it that's your business you cannot compromise on that okay so there is so there's also one other approach which has been described by jko from uh, south korea uh, from seoul where he actually goes Uh, through the lateral approach, uh, kind of dissecting it, his way in the sub, uh, just close to the bone, right across to the back, and he puts a kind of rim plate uh, with screws coming from the back to the front into this plate. It's a little technical to do, but he is shown and he's actually published on this technique of the posterior lateral corner where he puts a plate like that. Uh, from can you see the arrow here or not? No. See the arrow where that I'm pointing here? No, sir. It would come from your side. So, okay, but sorry, some sure arrow. Rim, it's a rim plate across the uh, going from the posterior lateral area across to the lateral onto the anterior. So it's curved round the posterior lateral area, and you put in screws through this plate uh, from back to front and also from side to side. Okay, so this kind of gives you a nice hold on it. I think it's published it a couple of years ago. Uh, uh so you can look at uh, but it. but but john that may be okay to if you want to use it as a raft principle if you want to yeah. compress like in this patient compression is required you have to so better he, so he also does that so he does a very so he does dissects all the way to the back between okay. the, under the lateral collateral ligament and does that so it's but it's technically difficult it's, you really need to angle in a very uh, sort of difficult direction to be able to get it so i have not really uh, tried it myself with rim plates up to around here but not across the back but he's uh, published on it and i think we are going to have a webinar maybe sometime in june or something where he'll be showing his technique i don't know so sir we have uh, another case 
Yeah, sure. I'm Dr. Malik Balodia from Junagad. Junagad, okay. Her years, uh, male skin condition good, has been uh, immobilized, swelling is reduced. What should be the sequence of restriction and what outcome is expected? Next, I'm showing the CT cell. The distal femur and the crossover will be affected, sir. So, so far in the femur. So, does he have the other CTs or just this three? I'll, I'll, I'll show him, sir. Okay. So Rajiv, you're the fixer. Can you go ahead and do that? <laughs> uh, trying to work it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, tibia, do you have that? Tibia, do you, uh, yeah, I think that's okay. Okay. Tibia posterior, posterior lateral. I, I think this this postural lateral yeah, the whole uh, basically good. postural lateral work basically the whole thing has to be a postural it has to be a postural lateral work so I would go postural lateral for this and basically dissect the nerve out go behind fix the hoffa from the back and the postural lateral fixation uh, from the back it will be postural lateral whole work has to be postural lateral high chance high chance of a vascular injury here even if it is not obvious. Because I'm going to go posterior, I would be better sure that my vessels are all right, so that I'm not blamed after the surgery. Can, can we just go back to the earlier scans? Because I, I still haven't fully understood the tibial fracture. I mean, the offer is open to them. Samson, go back, please. Yes, sir. I think uh, the slides are stuck. I'm not able to move back. Uh, let me try again, sir. Sure. Give me a moment, sir. It looked like a rim posterior lateral. Fracture. Yeah, but this is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has given that uh, it's a HOFAS, more short of bony posterior lateral corner injury. Yeah. There is a PCL bony avulsion. But PCL. this is anterior. You see this part? I mean, can you see the anterior part? This is the tibial tuberosity, I presume. Yeah. And so there's some anterior element also, or is it the... I think the whole intercondylar area is damaged. Okay, it's a very uh, unusual sort of fracture pattern. Uh, unusual, unusual. But because mainly the medial and the lateral condyle are quite intact, except that the yeah. lateral condyle is slightly tilted. So it's basically a lateral condyle fracture, more or less. I yeah, but there's a separate fragment which I want to understand. There's before. a fragment also there. Yeah. I'll share again, sir. Yeah, see if you can show that to us step by step. So not the 3D, the earlier ones, yeah. Yeah, the, so the reef, the, yeah, the next one. So you see this here, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay so this is a separate fragment here, okay? Which is gone anterior fragment. Okay, and uh, there is something anteriorly here as well. Okay, so you really need to understand all that. So you're gonna have to deal with the anterior part also. Yeah. Jitin, what do you think? Yeah, I think the medial side of the lateral condyle and also posterior is fractured. Yeah. I wouldn't bother so much about the middle combination which is there, which is there little more interior, but definitely the bigger piece, which probably has a PCL also with it at the back. That yeah. piece is fixed. Yeah. So, as uh, Dr. Yeah. Rajin mentioned, one incision going all the way from femur to tibia. And both can be neutralized by that. After that, if I find the depression is too much, I may try to elevate it and just pass two, three K wires to just build up that uh, midline depression. Yeah. And so this is one, again, it may be worth distracting for some time, yeah? Post-op. Yeah. yeah. Because see, you see the anterior depression here. It's actually, so this condyle is actually gone anteriorly here yeah. on Comminuted area. Can you see that? Uh, the section, the sagittal section on the below left corner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The good part here is stability wise, the medial condylar rim. Yeah, and medial side is okay. Condylar rim are okay. So yeah. stability wise is not going to have a problem. As far as alignment is concerned, mostly it is going to come from the femur, from the femoral condyle. At the last end, you will have some irregularity of the intercondylar area, which is mostly, you know, extra articular, more or less, in my mind. So I can maybe leave it also. 
his main he concern up. is that uh, even after best bony fixation and ligament reconstruction, what best outcome is expected at this age? He is only 30 years of age. Yes. He should have a good outcome. Yeah. Should have a good no. outcome. Yeah. Should be okay. Can I, can I just, the battle is lying completely out here. There's yeah. a complete PTFL, PTFL aversion also. My, it's got a That's what I'm saying. Maybe because, because of the fra because of lateral fracture, maybe. Yeah, because yeah. of the fracture, it has all got displaced. It's gone with the Hoffa. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. So definitely a challenging case and a one that you'll have to uh, plan very carefully. I think the first thing would be to deal with the Hoffa properly yeah. uh, and decide on the tibia based on the situation there. So. Yes, posterior, but you may also have to do something anteriorly for the combination anteriorly. Any indication for MRI in this? Because this will be also associated with a lot of... Uh, uh, MRI? MRI, fi MRI finding he has given that uh, it's uh, it's having a MCL tear, ACL tear, PCL bony avulsion, and uh, posterior lateral corner injury. Corner injury, yeah. So that's the, that's the basic problem. So you'll have to I would probably deal with the posterior injury at the same time and the uh, posterior uh, evulsion of the posterior, uh, posterior cruciate because it's a bony evulsion and then probably deal with the ACL and MCL later. Actually, good good part of all these ligament injuries associated with bony fracture. As if you, is, the bony is there to heal to heal a great extent. No, is, is that because of the hematoma all around? The capsule becomes slightly more thicker than what you would like. In spite of good movements, the capsule is thick. So they don't have a like flexibility of a normal capsule where all the instability can be felt. As soon as the capsule and the tissue around gets scarred, ligaments do nothing. They just sit there. They may be academic on an MRI, but they don't cause any instability. Though, as per literature, if you do MRI for 100 cases of upper tibial fracture, almost 70% will have some ligament injuries. But those are yeah. cosmetic, those are academic. They cause no problem because eventually most of these knees land up with some amount of capsular tightness and stiffness. So it's not as flexible a knee as a normal knee is. So and that comes to your advantage. And also reading the MRI in these sort of severe fractures, I think there's a lot of yeah, uh, artifact. Yeah, yeah, issues there. And so, is Ritab still there? So, what should be the final incision, sir, in this? So, Ritab, what would you think about MRI in this situation? No Will role, I... sir. Huh? Uh, no role because uh, it is evident that the PCL is injured here, sir, with the bony piece. It yeah. is evident that the medial collateral is injured. This technically is a knee dislocation, fracture dislocation. Yeah. So, the X-ray and the CT are showing that all the ligaments are injured. So the addition of an MRI is of no value addition. I would rather suggest a CT angio and beware of intimal injury. Yeah, that that is something I'd be particular also. Yes. In yes. This Before touching the patient. Yeah. Because with dislocation, the risk of iso uh, uh, vascular injury is almost fifty percent. So I would sometimes, agree. sometimes they show up after the surgery. Yeah, so I would reduce this dislocation, put a spanning fixator, and then probably uh, consult Dr. John and Dr. Maheshwari before touching this patient. <laughs> I like that. Okay, so I think uh, we have finished our allotted time, so maybe we Can should bring things to an end. is there so, any other case? Yes, sir. We have another case. I'll take another two minutes to load the case. Sir. Okay, okay. Dr. John, sir, if you have, sir, so that we can finish it. And if Dr. Manoj Chaudhary, sir. I think we'll really go on for too long, so we'll do that some other time, yeah? Okay, okay. Right, right. Dr. Manoj Chaudhary, sir, do you want to add something, sir, our president? One thing I have to ask. Uh, what about fracture of fibula in the proximal part? Do we address it? At which level, sir? Exactly. Be precise. At, which level? At the neck of the uh, fibula. Neck of the fibula. So, I think uh, the fibula fracture may have some uh, uh, kind of uh, importance to your decision making as to whether 
what fixation you use, but in terms of fixing the fib fibula fracture, that's not something that we do very often, unless there's an evulsion of the fibula collateral ligament of the fibula. If that's a situation where you'd want to fix it, otherwise you won't be fixing the fibula neck fracture. But it does mean that your support on the lateral side is lost, so you may have to uh, give good support to the lateral side in your fixation. Dr. Samshul is working for one case, what he has got today. So maybe he will be posting just now. By the way, any more question, Dr. Rajiv Anand, sir, Secretary? Uh, no, uh, I don't think uh, there is any question left. Uh, so maybe you can ask uh, Mr. Vijay uh, uh, to... Uh, yeah, yeah, Mr. Vijay Das uh, from Johnson, who is basically yes. doing everything. Are you... Yeah, Dr. Vijay. Uh, Mr. Vijay, your words. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, your voice is being interrupted. Yeah, okay. your audio is not working. Uh, the, just speak. Take the this thing off. Disconnect it. Yeah. Disconnect, yeah. Disconnect. Disc disconnect okay. the uh, microphone. Take okay. it off and do it. Right, sir? Yeah, right. right. Sir, I'm audible. Yeah, 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 right. uh, yeah, sir, yeah. Uh, on behalf of Yatsen Pharmaceutical, which is a pharma division of Johnson & Johnson, I'm uh, very thankful to all the uh, uh, faculty members uh, for, uh, by their support, this uh, meeting has been uh, conducted, we have conducted very successfully. Uh, I would like to uh, give a special thanks to my faculty members for this though, especially uh, Dr. John Mukhopadhyay, sir, Dr. Rachel Bishan, sir, Dr. Hiten Vishwari, uh, Dr. Rajiv Chaudhary, and uh, of course, sir, uh, I would also like to thank uh, our moderator, Dr. Amit Kumar Singh, uh, BO President, Dr. Manoj Chaudhary, uh, BO Secretary, Dr. Rajiv Anand, and of course, Dr. This one, Dr. Samsun, who has uh, uh, coordinated this event. Uh, very grateful uh, for giving this opportunity to part of this show. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Thank, you. Great. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. And Samshul, is it possible? Otherwise, we will wind up and we'll take up the case yes, sir, uh, I'll just, next uh, hour. I'll, I'll just be back in, in a minute, sir. Give me a moment. Okay. Uh, some, so uh, then let's move. wind up. Then, yeah. seconds, yeah. uh, he is ready, okay. sir. Almost, almost ready. Okay, okay. If he's ready. Yeah, a quick response to the last question, sir, I think is... Sure. What's the question? Oh, no. Like, he's... I'm just asking Samshul... Okay, for the case. For the case, sir. Uh, while we are waiting, uh, how many of you? Sorry, it's not audible. Sir. Rajiv, we can hear you. Uh, I just, I have always, I, can you hear me? I've always struggled with the floppy lateral position for the seniors. Any tricks? Somehow, I, my whole orientation goes off. Yeah, I, I, agree with you. I agree with you. I never do it. <laughs> I just turn the patient upside down. I just, Exactly. So I've tried doing it. it. Just everything goes off in my head. I can't. No, no. With that virus position, that fracture always tends to go into virus. This is very struggle. I mean, even posterior medial plate is tricky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A case, sir. A case is it's got here. Got the CT by Doctor Shashi Shekhar. There's no history yet, sir. I just got the okay. CT only, sir. So can you put it on full screen, or this is as far as it will go? Start number one. Yes. Okay, so what have we got here? So lateral. Okay. Turn it around. Turn. One more, sir. This much we have, sir. We have no x-rays? Uh, not yet, sir. And no other sections, CT sections? Just these two, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this, so I think. History of uh, RTA with uh, swelling and blisters. Fracture was spanned with ring etc. Okay. So is strong, and no evidence of any vascular or no sir, no sir. Apartment syndrome etc. Okay. It's so unstable. So swelling has settled down and now we have to plan our fixation. Exactly, sir. So this CT is very nicely uh, kind of demonstrating something that I like saying. When you have multiple fractures, 
look at the fracture that is your enemy so for example where is this knee wanting to go this femur is pushing this knee behind that yeah. means my main metaphysical support has to be behind not in the front wherever the fractures are they are they are cosmetic as soon as i put my posterior condyles in place in relation to the posterior shaft this knee will come in place a lot of fractures will just fall in place automatically so the alignment factor whether it is medial or posterior you should be able to decide where your knee wants to go and this picture on the right is showing very clearly that this femur is pushing the posterior condyle out and it is kind of causing that split between the anterior and the posterior condyle so here i'm going to go go posterior i i i hope there are two posterior fractures or maybe one only but whichever and definitely on the posterior medial side in a prone prone position and then i will see what to do with the front part because here to keep the alignment as i say for me interarticular reduction is not that crucial more crucial to get the alignment right and for that i think i'll have to go posteriorly first here of course i need to see more x rays and more ct scans i think here definitely postero medial actually so this is the large postero medial fragment and if you look at the femur it's gone along with the postero medial fragment okay so i think you're going to need to buttress it postero medially and you also have a lateral fracture uh, whether you address that from a, a lateral incision or from the back is something we need more uh, sections for to be able to really decide on okay that's how i'd look at it anyone else uh, ritab you want to say something rajiv oh, same sir yeah well, my planning prone posterior medial incision in fact possibly two apices main apex is posterior as dr maheshwari said the nice robust plate posterior posteriorly one plate also posterior medial is a bit more medial anterior because you look at the apex in front can you see that in just if you look at the last one there's an apex coming down that also needs another uh, buttressing then i'll pay, close the wound flip him supine and do the lateral side that's what we have planned four plates two three plates three plates, four plates. one one three plates should do it because why not one five? large portion push uh, <laughs> that you why not five, five. <laughs> Why not? I mean, you can put in. I mean, uh, you can put in as many number of. The whole idea is one, not. One message I would like to give is, if yeah. you use three or four synthes plates, you know what it means. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas actually, yes, you sir. must understand the principle. It is mm -hmm. buttressing. Any simple recon plate or any simple forearm, whatever plate. If you yeah. know the principle of buttressing, and you just under buttress your plate, any plate which can be. under shaped under molded you can say it serves the purpose sir, sir, so you can spend save lot of money by not using all these pre molded plates all the time just 3.5 bcp just just gone so i think we need to actually decide on the lateral side whether we need to do it posteriorly or anteriorly like, okay so that's the thing that you have to so yeah so you may have to do a So sometimes we do a separate postero medial and a separate postero lateral incision for some of these. Okay, so you put a bigger plate on the lateral side, on the medial side. I uh, put and then if necessary, make us so in the prone position, you make a postero lateral incision and buttress that extreme corner which you can't actually get easily from the medial side because in the medial side, even though you can get your uh, uh, sort of uh, levers right across between the tibia and fibula, when you put your plate, it never goes. to the postero lateral corner okay right actually what happens more often than not once you fix the medial side lateral yeah. side looks much better true but as you, you need to look at it and then decide we don't have all the sections uh, 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 like doing like a si joint put the i think there are some more ct sections actually if you look down uh, shamshul or are, are they of some other patient i thought i saw some other formats go down keep going also it's the same one that is coming again and again there is a transfer kind of a thing in the middle number eight. number 8 i mean how many times have number you had to take the gastrocnemius off from the medial side number 8 slide some soon i've not done it i mean i i can understand the need for it sometimes but so that is for previous in case the case like this in the for case previous like case of Yeah, you could do it. Just take the camera. I do. I I do. I do partial tenotomy often. 
It doesn't matter. And then put the, you can just switch it. Put the plate. Put the plate. Yeah, yeah, like it's it's described yeah. as well. You can do it in autumn. No problem. You can. There are a lot of good suture material these days. I think they divide the bhattacharya is divide uh, sort of described an approach where you take it off completely. Okay. And now with the anchors available, we don't mind removing anything from anywhere. Two <laughs> <laughs> anchors and stick it back. Can't get any more pictures. I think we should uh, wind up. Yeah, we would like to wind yeah. up now. Yeah, we shall uh, remove the yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really thankful to thank our you. president, Manoj Chaudhary, sir, for allowing the Bihar Orthopedic Association to come to this level and share the good, good knowledge of proximal tibial fracture to all of the viewers. And there were about 1,100 viewers at present for the last two hours. Thank you very much, our secretary, sir, Dr. Rajiv Anand, especially all the learned and talented faculty members, Dr. Jitin Maheshwari, our guru, Dr. John Mukhopadhyay, Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee, and Dr. Ritab. Dr. Mr. Vijay and man of the day, uh, moment, Samshul, Samshul also. Thank you very much. We would like to leave at present. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you once uh, again. Thank you, sir. Uh, right now we had uh, more than 1,500 viewers. Oh, 1,500. Great. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, so once this, again, at the last, uh, uh, I should uh, thank all the faculties and all the delegates, 1,500 viewers. I thank a lot. And uh, especially th my special thanks to Jensen Pharmaceuticals, our division of JNJ. Thank you very much. It was indeed a very good uh, webinar. Just now I got two messages from our IOA president and IOA secretary, Dr. Atul yeah. Silvastro, that the webinar was excellent and it was being by their uh, state uh, states as well. Thank, Thank you so sir. much. So, uh, sir, last two questions I forward to Amule, sir. Can you please, sir? Rajiv and Samshul, can you also try to get some kind of feedback from people if possible? Yeah, definitely, yeah, sir. I'll can, release our Google form, sir. Yeah. Okay. So there is uh, one more, sir. Some more question from uh, <laughs> uh, Milan Joshi. Any anytime one needs to do some meniscal arthrotomy on medial side, we have already dealt it. No. Uh, Milan no. Joshi is also asking tibial condyla widening is no. This is the same old question, na? Yes, sir. Anything, but anything the medial new? side submeniscal arthrotomy is an interesting question. Uh, and uh, Rajiv, you're the approach man. Uh, he doesn't look at the surface on the medial side. Medial, medial side is usually a big chunk, but the hands seen once in my life with a little sliver of bone. It was coming down. So if you have very small fragments, the one that uh, I think that's a fresh shoot, anterior prim fragments, Anterior rim fragments. If you have an anterior, I have had a middle rim fragment. Okay. There I had to go submeniscal arthrotomy, put the rim uh, fragment back, and put, to fix it with uh, two 2.4 millimeter screws, closed it down, and did my buttressing. So, how did you do submeniscal arthrotomy through the medial collateral ligament? No, from the back. From the back. I, mean, I did part, part, part of it. So you're doing part, of, part it. of it. Just part That's of it. Didn't, didn't take out the whole I think so. so I had to. So, like I, like you said, you buttress the corner, but there are times when the articular surface does not come into place and we've done open reductions and we work through the front and the back of the collateral ligament and even make windows in the ligament to do that. Okay, so it's not always reduced when you, when you especially if there's comminution, then your buttress may not reduce your articular portion and you still end up with that double shadow there. So there, I would go into the joint and reduce that contact. It at the back, but those are unusual uh, circumstances that you have to do that. Okay. Uh, one, one, John, can you, the patient I did two of the both of them come back with creaking sound in the in the knee, like goes squelch squelch. Have you faced that? One that I've done of medial side submeniscal arthrotomy and repaired it with the little screws. The X-rays look okay, but they come back with the when the flexion exchange the squelching sound. No, I, I had that. Uh, I think you're I doing know. something. Strange to them. I, 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 I don't know what I've done. <laughs> anyway, okay, I think uh, is that it? I hope. Thanks. I uh, like thank all the faculty, uh, Jitain, for helping planning it as well, uh, Ritab for his excellent presentation, and Rajiv as well for a very good uh, presentation on the approaches and the fixation techniques. Uh, I hope this was useful for people. That is all we can. Uh, yes, especially good feedback is coming, especially on our yeah. UAV uh, WhatsApp yeah. group. Thank you very much. Once again, I will finally leave the meeting, conclude the meeting, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, sir. With this, uh, I'm uh, ending the live stream, sir.